الحمد لله واشهد ان لا اله الا الله Can you guys hear me? Yes. We praise God and we bear witness we praise God and we bear witness that there is only one God. Um, so, we obviously hang out together most of the times and all our conversations are already about God. Um, and we actually, most of our conversations are about the nitty gritty of God's commandments. Should you do engagement first or marriage second? Um, which is obviously great conversations. I'm not saying that, th that they are not, but it's like uh, pro conversations or advanced conversations. Um, and in the midst of these conversations, we um, take some things for granted, one of which is our belief in God. Um, and the first part of my sermon is mainly uh, for the younger people in the masjid, uh, not that it's not for everyone, but it's mainly for people who are uh, mingling with outsiders outside of our community. There is a lot of atheists out there. And lately I had an encounter with an atheist that I wanted to share. And it basically talks more about the existence of God rather than the details of, of the commandments. Um, so that's the first part of my sermon. Then the second part of my sermon, God willing, is about a conversation that I had with a submitter. So one is about an atheist, one is about a submitter. Um, so as many of you know, um, I, have, um, uh, I have an AI company, thank God, and um, I'm not the guy who builds the AI, I have a really smart co-founder. And uh, we lately had a uh, conversation about how smart he is, and uh, people like, um, were at my place, and we were talking about like, that this guy is exceptional, he's super smart, and uh, so on and so forth. Then two days later, I was traveling with him somewhere, and um, I don't know what I was saying. I was saying something uh, like God willing or something. And all of the blue, all out of the blue, he goes, uh, do you know that most of the things that you believe in are tales from the past? So I want to read this verse first. Then I want to talk about the conversation we had. Uh, surprisingly, actually, uh, I was shaken by the conversation. Um, and I was thinking like, wow, like I kind of never thought of this stuff. And when someone encountered me like, like it caught me off guard and started posing all these arguments. I wasn't able actually to articulate good responses. So that's why I want to give a sermon about that. Um, so 625, some of them listen to you, but we place veils on their hearts to prevent them from understanding and deafness in their ears. Thus, no matter what kind of proof they see, they cannot believe. Thus, when they come to argue with you, the disbelievers say these are tales from the past. Um, so basically the story that he was telling me is that there is, uh, uh, that all the scriptures that we read are based on stories from the past and that one of the proofs is there is a valley that existed way before like the Bible, it's called Jahanna. And this is a valley in Jerusalem where people used to sacrifice their kids there and it's used to symbolize like torture, it used to symbolize like the bad uh, or the punishment. And that this is how the word Jahannam exists in the Bible, exists in the Quran. And this is just a proof that it's not something that is coming from God. It's a word that existed uh, and humans used to use uh, on daily basis. And those are the same people who wrote the scriptures. Uh, then he started talking about like the story of Abraham um, and that how many other, like when he was, uh, had the dream about sacrificing Ishmael and that this is super related to Jahanna. He just kept telling me stories uh, that existed before the scripture and some of these stories are already in the scripture as a proof that it's not the word of God. Um, other verse I wanted to read. Um, then he goes, um, and then let's hypothetically think that God exists. Uh, do you think that God is the most merciful? So obviously I said yes. He said then, if God is the most merciful and he wants everyone to believe, then God should just physically come to earth. Then if we all see God, then there will be no doubt whether God exists or not, problem solved. And obviously the verse that I had in mind, so all of these arguments, I wasn't able to respond, but I had like verses in the Quran. Um, so the verse I had in mind is, uh, in 255, recall that you said, O oh Moses, we will not believe unless we see God physically. Consequently, the lightning struck you as you looked. The interesting thing is like all these arguments actually existed in the Quran. I come to Quran study like twice a week and I read Quran, thank God, every day. And I know all this stuff, but I wasn't able to articulate responses. And that's why 
I, I was talking about like um, that we sh sometimes just have to go an upper level from the details of the commandments. Um, then for a really few days I was like, wow, I was thinking of all this stuff and then I started thinking of the Quran's miracle and I was just, I, to be honest, I was shaking like the, the and he, he's a very convincing guy, so like you, you, you just get overwhelmed. Then I started thinking, wow, Lily, when she grows up and goes to school, she's probably going to see like tens of, these, of this guy, and I probably have to actually articulate my answer. I mean, deep inside, I know that God exists, but I wasn't able to like verbally articulate a response or an argument. And I felt like he just won the argument, just like that. Like five minutes, I was like, boom, blown. <laughs> like, I was like, wow, this didn't even last 10 minutes. Um, so... I, uh, I, I started reading some verses uh, in the Quran, and one of the verses uh, that really was very significant to me was 2164. In the creation of the heavens and the earth, the alternation of night and day, the ships that roam the ocean for the benefit of the people, the water that God sends down from the sky to revive dead land and spread in, in it all kinds of creatures, the manipulation of the winds and the clouds that are placed between the sky and the earth, these are, there are sufficient proofs for people who understand. So obviously, God talks about these as proofs. And the question that I had is like, how are those kind of a proof? How can I respond back and say, well, God exists because ships are roaming the sea? I mean, would I win the argument? And obviously, I wouldn't win the argument. So I started thinking more of the verse, and I wanted to talk today about the creation or the concept of creating something or the concept of building something. So... Interestingly enough, the work that this guy is building was somehow um, uh, guiding for me to understand, to actually understand the verse better, to understand the verse about creation better. So let me tell you uh, what we actually try to do at, at, at my company. It's not an ad, but <laughs> it's just in the context of it. Um, we basically have been existing for more than 24 months, and we've spent close to $5 million trying to do one single task. It is reading a document like that. That's all what we need to do at my company, right? People have invested millions of dollars, have a really big team, super smart people, a lot of like ups and downs, and the ultimate goal is to look at a medical record, is to look at a patient's chart, and without a human being, you build a machine that is able to read the record and understand what's in it, something that Probably Lily in a year or two, God willing, is able to, like, it's just any kid in the masjid is able to do it. It's not really a complicated thing for a human being. But guess what? For a machine, it's super complicated to do that. Uh, and this guy is in charge of building this, is in charge of building a machine that is able to read like a human being. And guess what? Um, it's, we didn't build it fully, like we did some great progress, but we didn't fully build it. I wanna talk today about like why and how complicated create, creation is. So um, there is three ways to build an artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm not an AI guy, so for all the techie people, take whatever I say with a grain of salt. It just, <laughs> um, I try to understand. It's really sometimes hard uh, because whenever I sit in the room in the company, I'm most probably the dumbest guy in the room. Um, because they're all talking about things I don't understand. Um, but I'll try to simplify the concepts that, that exist. So there's three ways that you can build an AI with. Um, one way is called reinforcement learning. And what that pretty much means is you build the machine, and you let this machine do any kind of act that it wishes to do. And if it does something that you like, you just give it a reward. Then the machine learns that every time it does this, it's going to get a reward. And if it does an action that you don't like, you penalize the machine. So it learns that it doesn't have to do this anymore. Um, does this sound like something? You know, it sounds actually like God's system. Uh, you step out of God's kingdom, there's something that happens. You step into God's kingdom, you get a reward, right? So in a sense, it sounds to be a simple concept, um, but it is not actually that of a simple concept, and I want to explain why. So one of the arguments that atheists usually have is... Uh, if God is so merciful, why are people dying in Africa? If God is so merciful, why would people suffer? If God is so merciful, why all this kind of arguments? Like the, the, the fact that God is a merciful entity um, doesn't sit well with them with the fact that there is misery on earth. Um, so let me explain actually how those AI system work. So 
the penalty in this reinforcement learning is not an action. It's the lack of a reward. Unexplain what that means. So you don't actually do something bad to the model. You actually don't do anything. You just, you just let the model be, and that on its own is a punishment. And it's exactly how God's system is. There is no, there is no such a thing like punishment. There is no such a thing like a penalty that we incur as human beings. Actually, there is only rewards. There is only good stuff happening. There is only reinforcement. Every time you do something good, you get something great. There is an action. And every time you do something wrong, you basically don't get anything. And the lack of you not getting anything is what allows you to get punished. So in a way, um, if you look at, and when I asked him, like he was saying, look, uh, reinforcement learning is great. Machine is so kind, it never penalizes the algorithm. It only does great stuff, which is exactly the same system that we know that exists in, in, on, on Earth. God never does anything or do anything bad for us. It's the lack of God's protection that puts us into trouble. The other thing, um, so that's, I, I, I mean, those are very like uh, non-connected thoughts. It's just like um, some, uh, some things that I was thinking of and I wanted to share. There is another kind of, um, of learning which is actually really bad. Um, not really bad, but it's a very risky learning. It's called supervised learning. So in the supervised learning, say you want the machine to know how an apple looks like, you just show it millions of images of an apple, then when the machine looks at it, it knows that this is an apple. Now, if you show the machine, if you're Hussein, for example, and you show the machine apples and you say it's an orange, the machine will say that it is an orange. So bad data in, bad data out. That's why it's a very risky business. Uh, you have to be super careful in, in doing that. So for example, in, in, in our company, we have a team of like 30 people who are all the time doing those labeling. Uh, we had one guy who screwed it up and the whole models went down because he just fed the machine with the wrong data. Um, and in, 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 a, in a sense, the best way of doing that, a good AI scientist, the way he, he should approach this kind of a model is he should go always not look at the model, but look at the training data, see like what's happening there. Um, and this guy failed to do that. Uh, what I mean is, on, on daily basis, we're getting a lot of labeled data. So for example, if you live in the Silicon Valley, it's a labeled data that if you put a hoodie on, you're most probably a smarter guy than if you put a suit on. That's a labeled thing. Um, if you are in East Coast, for example, it's a label that if you put a hoodie on, then most probably you're homeless and you have to put on a shirt when you go to meetings. My point is, like on daily basis, we're looking at a lot of labeled data. People tell you, that if this happens, this is the label for it. And what God asks us to do is ask us to re-examine those labels. I want to read the verse. Examine all inherited information, 728. They commit a gross sin. They say, we found our parents doing this, and God has commanded us to do it. Say, God never advocates sin. Are you saying about God what you do not know? And the subtitle is ex examine all inherited information. So it is a labeled thing in the scientific community that God does not exist. It's just a label. So every time someone talks to you about God, you just say, no, God doesn't exist because that's how your system is trained. But do you actually go and look at, the, at, at why you reached that conclusion? So when I asked him more detailed questions later on, he was like, I don't know. I, I don't really understand. It's like all the questions, he went from being super certain to being like, well, I actually didn't think of this before. Um, so a good way of arguing with, a, with, with an atheist actually um, is going back to the labeled data, is actually trying to ask like more uh, detailed questions rather than being uh, taken with the first uh, encounter. Um, as, um, as a side note, um, this is actually how we also in Masjid have hard times getting why engagement is part of marriage because we have a lot of labeled data that engagement and marriage are completely <laughs> separate things. But guess what? They are not. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, so re-examine your inherited knowledge. Um, the other thing is um, the unsupervised learning. So one is reinforcement learning, one is supervised learning, the other thing is unsupervised learning. And what that is, you just put data and you let the machine do whatever the heck the machine wants to do. The machine has to figure out patterns on its own. Um, and this is how we actually Tesla works, uh, which is very um, 
it's a very bad thing, right? Because you never know what kind of patterns the machine knows. Um, so if there's a lot of bad drivers, you know, like the machine is not gonna perform well. Uh, but anyways, um, and I think in this uh, kind of learning, it's all about finding patterns, right? Um, so I wanted to talk about this. Um, in 341, um, at the end of the verse it says, commemorate your Lord frequently and meditate night and day. And the concept of meditation exists in the Quran like a lot. It's super frequent commandment to meditate on God. And we obviously understand that mentioning God, praying, all of that is meditation. But I, I feel like this is actually more advanced uh, level of meditation, which is recognizing the patterns. So things like, there are several planets like Earth, but life only exists on Earth. Now beat that, right? It's super hard for, for an atheist to respond to something like this. The Earth, the way it is tilted, if it's tilted one inch right or one inch left, there is no living on Earth. How perfect is the creation? So all those kind of patterns, you're only able to, to notice if you meditate on God and you observe God's creations, which is something that I personally never do, right? Uh, I know a lot of submitters here who does that, but I'm all the time thinking that if I just go to the Quran study, I pray, now I meditated on God. And the conversation with this guy just made me think like, uh, maybe the concept of meditations I have to take more serious and trying to figure out the kind of patterns in, in the creation. So, uh, with that, Tubu uh, ilallah. Alhamdulillah, wa ashadu anna la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. We praise God and we bear witness that there is only one God. Uh, it actually took more time than I thought. Um, in the same vein about uh, the technology stuff, um, one night at 3 a.m. in the morning, Ashkan Zarif called me and said that, hey, uh, I locked myself out of the office. I don't have my phone, I don't have anything. I basically went to the security guard and he said, just get out of here. So I went home, but everything is on and we have heaters in the office, so it's illegal. So you have to go shut down the heaters. Anyways, long story short, I had to go to the office at 3 a.m. And <laughs> I went to the office and I opened the door and there was all this talking about uh, harassment and people harassing each other. So Ashkan forgot his YouTube and it was just talking about really weird stuff. I mean, obviously he had to lock himself out, but here's what I got to see. I got to see this screen. So uh, this screen is basically uh, a processing time for an algorithm. So what I figured out that 60% of the time that I'm paying for, for engineers in the office, is spent looking at a, a screen like this. It's basically, uh, you run an algorithm, and then you have to wait till the algorithm performs, because those are very sophisticated algorithms. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Right? So just to give you context, we spent six months trying to reduce the time of reading a document from, I don't know, three minutes to just one minute. It just takes a lot of time. So you run an algorithm, you wait two, three hours, sometimes you wait six hours, sometimes you wait a week. And then at the end of this, the algorithm fails, so you have to go run again. And at the meantime, those engineers are free-floating organisms in the company <laughs> that have nothing to do but to give you hard times. And every time you talk, they say, it's processing time. Um, so, and as you can see, in this thing, Ashkin was in the office till 3 a.m. in the morning, and this algorithm failed. It didn't even work. So the guy stayed, imagine this, like imagine you run one simple task, one simple thinking task for six hours. You lock yourself out, and you still the algorithm doesn't work. Um, so I started looking into that and um, I started asking every other engineer and they actually all said the same thing. They spend most of their time just waiting on those algorithms to work. Uh, and what I figured out, I started looking at it, is your brain is 30 times more powerful than a supercomputer. Can you believe that? So the thing that takes forever, your brain is, is just doing it in a fraction of a second. Um, it's really crazy, like when I started thinking of it. So you are 30, more than 30 supercomputer powers moving on Earth. So yeah, God didn't come physically to Earth, but God gave us supercomputing powers 
that we should be able to use to run those algorithms and figure out the patterns, figure out what is wrong, what is good, and, and actually see the outcomes of God's creation to reach this conviction. Um, so imagine, like, this is just a shot in one server room. This guy sometimes runs tens of these, and it's, like, bigger than a human being. Your brain is 30 times more powerful than that. Um, the interesting thing is, do you know how expensive computing power is? Uh, let me tell you how expensive. <laughs> so, on average, Ashkin spends around $10,000 every two weeks running those things, right? <laughs> you do spend that. <laughs> so, you can only imagine that it is not only like that your brain is able to carry all this computing power in such a small skull, it's super expensive, actually. Like, the kind of thinking that you have every minute that you're spending on Earth, if Google is charging you for it, you're not going to even survive. Like, imagine how merciful God is. Like, the amount of comp free computing power that you have all the time um, is, is, is crazy. Um, so I want to read this. Um, the example of such disbelievers is that of parrots who repeat what they hear of sounds and calls without understanding. Deaf, dumb, and dumb, that's the main thing point and blind they cannot understand the the last thing I want to show them I move actually to my second sermon uh, shall try to fast um, this is another big thing that I face almost every day in the company for all the tech guys here they know that what that is it's basically called a Jira board and it's a way of managing tasks right so imagine uh, when you're using snapchat for example or something like that do you know that people spend month, if not years, trying to create this super small product. And then this product is full of bugs, it's full of non-functioning things. And if you, if, if you know like how these things work, you have to have product managers, engineers, quality control, you have to have like armies of people trying to create three, four screens. That's pretty much what they're trying to do. Um, and you have to manage all those things, then when it's done, it's actually not working, so you have to, like, also a few days ago, I had a conversation with Ashkin, and I was saying, I was making a joke, I was saying, oh, did you guys break everything? He said, no, because everything is already broken. So, <laughs> it actually just gives you a taste of how creating something is really super hard. It just, all the time, things are broken. Um, now imagine having the whole universe, if humans are trying to create just one single thing, like, a, a machine to read a document, right? Imagine how much like everything was created by God in like nothing. Like God just says, be, and it is. So really God is, is, is great, and um, I just wanted to share those thoughts with you. And it's super funny that when I started telling this guy about the stuff, he was like, oh, wow. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, Now, uh, the other thing I want to talk about, I'll try to do this quickly, is I actually had a conver another conver interesting conversation with a submitter. And it, I was asking him, uh, he went through some hard times. That was actually a year ago. Uh, and he went through some hard times. He's one of the people that I, 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 I perceive as one of the best submitters in the masjid. So I was asking him, how was it? He was like, yeah, thank God, everything is fine. Uh, I, I just figured out that I'm actually not a submitter. That's how the conversation started. I was like, wow, what do you mean, um, like all these years? Um, so basically, the guy labeled himself, so I perceive him as a great submitter. And he labeled himself as not being a submitter altogether, uh, which is kind of a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, and it got me thinking about this. Um, so basically, we know that most of the believers are destined to help which actually means that a lot of the submitters are not actually submitters, because if they are submitters, they are going to end up in, in heavens. So given that we know that most submitters and most believers are actually destined to hell, then the chances are really high that a lot of us are actually not even submitters. And it just takes uh, an encounter like this. Like, those are all stuff that sits in the back of our heads, uh, but when someone have a conversation with you, then it just enlightens you to start thinking about this. Um, so anyway, so he told me this, and I was like, this guy's just exaggerating, he's too pious, he's actually a great submitter, and I just went through the, the experience. But then a year passes by, and a lot of events starts happening in my life, and I actually figure out the same thing. I figure out that I'm actually maybe not a submitter. 
And I want to explain what I mean by that. So um, I started thinking of submission as, imagine submission as being three different vectors or three different sets of things that you have to do. On the very right side, it's actions. It's things like paying charity, paying zakat, going to masjid, praying, uh, all this kind of stuff. All the kind of uh, physical actions that you have to do, being nice, smiling in everyone's face, and so on. Um, then, on the left side, there is the innermost thoughts. Uh, I want to read this verse. Uh, to God belongs, ev uh, it's 2, 2, to God belongs everything in the heavens and the earth. Whether you declare your innermost thoughts or keep them hidden, God holds you responsible for them. So it's not only about our actions. Guess what? If you have a thought and it's not a good thought, you will be held responsible for it. So it is actually a set of things. And the third thing is purification. So one is your actions, two is your thoughts. The third thing is your ability to examine yourself and try to change your actions and change your thoughts. I, I consider that as a third vector. So uh, I want to read another verse. It's 9108, and at the end of the verse it says, um, in it, there are people who love to be purified. God loves those who purify themselves. And there is a lot of verses in the Quran, obviously, about examining yourself. Now, here is the tricky part. The tricky part is you are very conscious of your actions. And people are also conscious of your actions. So if you pray, if you go to masjid, if you do all those kind of stuff, people label you as a submitter. <coughs> and you label yourself as a submitter. And you take that for granted. It's exactly like the whole mother thing where your data is labeled. So every time you go out, you say, God willing, people say, wow, look at this guy, he's so pious. Um, you come to masjid and people are like partying, so you feel so good about yourself. You feel like I'm really good. Everyone is bad and I'm the best person on earth. Uh, so basically your actions are surfaced all the time and they are deceiving actions. Then the other two things are not surfaced. Hence, we, we think of people as believers when they are actually hypocrites because we cannot see their innermost thoughts. We just see their actions. And we ourselves sometimes think of ourselves as believers when we are actually not believers. So I want to talk about some things that we have to consider in our innermost thoughts really quickly. So one thing is um, the awareness of the hereafter. So all of us think that we believe in the hereafter. Um, I had this conversation with a submitter, and I was telling him what I was going through, and he said, I just don't think that you believe in the hereafter. I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? Um, but actually, he's right, because if you're believing in the hereafter, you know that everything here is just transient, so you're never going to fear, you're never going to be worried, you're never going to be super happy, you're not just going to be a normal human being in the sense of how humans are. But guess what? I'm actually like that. I get worried, I get afraid, I get super excited, I get super frustrated, I have a temper issue. So all of that are indicators of not being aware of the hereafter. So your actions tells you that you're aware of the hereafter, but actually your innermost thoughts is not aware of the hereafter. Um, the other thing is knowing God's qualities, right? So you go into an event, something wrong happens in your life, and you quickly go into being despair or something really good happens in your life and you quickly go into, wow, I'm really so smart. Um, all those kind of things, and we do them every single day without being conscious about them, and right after we do it, we go to masjid, so we feel good about ourselves. My point is, your actions act as a sedative pill. It makes you feel good, but guess what, you're not good. Um, the third thing, the, th the third thing is mindfulness of God, and Ali gave a whole sermon about that. And it's actually, I think, one of the weakest points that I figured out. And mindfulness of God is, I do not think that someone who's mindful of God will be able to sin. It just doesn't come together. If you're thinking of God, you're not going to backbite. If you're thinking of God, you're not going to be angry. If you're thinking of God, you're not going to hold temper against another submitter. So a lot of these actions we do every day, and we come to masjid, we gave the dose. We got your sedative dose. You thought of God for two hours. Awesome. Let's go out. Now you're no longer mindful of God. Now you're becoming part of the machine, part of the system. So those are three things that uh, I started thinking of. Then the last thing is purification. Um, 
So what I mean by what I mean by purification is, remember the the, the reinforcement learning thing. So you go into. So I want to read this. Uh, I actually don't have time. So there is a verse that talks about that God gives them exacting tests every year, once or twice, and they never take heat. So you come into this life, you're not happy, you're not perfect, things are not going well, but deep inside, I'm such a righteous guy, and everything is going to be fine. So what ends up happening, things are not going to be fine, because you didn't examine yourself. I want to read this verse. It's a really profound verse. Uh, and the subtitle is Deterioration of Religion, 5716. Is it not time for those who believed to open up their hearts for God's message and the truth that is revealed herein? So this verse is basically addressing people who believed and telling them it's time to open up your heart, which means that there are believers who don't have their hearts open. Their actions are there, but their hearts are locked. Then the rest of the verse says, they should not be like the followers of previous scriptures whose hearts became hardened with time and consequently many of them turned wicked. So every time things are not going fine in your life and you're giving it time, guess what? You can turn wicked by time. If you are um, actually a submitter, everything should be perfect. And if you're not, you're just not a submitter. It doesn't matter whether you come to masjid or not. It doesn't matter whether people think of you as a submitter or not. As a matter of fact, you are worse than disbelievers. So we know that hypocrites are worse than disbelievers. And what hypocrites are, they are people who think of themselves as being submitters. People perceive them as being submitters, but they are not. So your chances are actually way, way, way worse than a disbeliever, which is a very, very profound fact. Um, one last uh, note. Um, some of the things that I have also uh, figured out is that there is a one big litmus test in the Quran, and I want to read this verse and end with it. Um, so proclaim if your parents, your children, your siblings, your spouses, your family, the money you have earned, a business you worry about, and the homes you cherish are more beloved to you than God and his messenger, and the striving in his cause, then wait until God brings his judgment. God does not guide the wicked people. Uh, it's a really profound verse. Like, I never understood this verse till I got a daughter, and I know how much I love her. Then it's a really good litmus test to ask yourself, do you love God and the message more than you love your own daughter or your own business? Um, I'll let you answer this question for yourself. Um, Akim Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Wa akbar. Allahu Akbar. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdin as-sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-ladhin an'amta alayhim. Ghayr al-maghdub alayhim. Wala al-dalim. Allahu Akbar. Sami Allah liman hamida. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.